<laughs> okay, can you all take a seat? <laughs> Welcome to Game Day 2015. Let me introduce Hal Stern, the Dean of the Donald Brennan School of Information and Computer Sciences. Thanks, Dan. Uh, the Dean's job is basically to be the outside or the representative voice of the school. So it's my great honor to really be here today to kick off the first game day, the first of many game days, hopefully. Um, as most of you in the room know, uh, this game day is bringing together a uh, large amount of activity that's been kind of brewing on campus <coughs> for the last five, even 10 years, maybe even a little bit longer than that. In particular, uh, there's a computer game science major uh, that started about five years ago. And so we have students from the computer game science major here, and that major is kind of an instrumental part of game day. In addition, also about five years ago, uh, my predecessor is Dean set up a research center in ICS that has now grown up and been given the campus's stamp as an organized research unit that is a highly interdisciplinary group of faculty across campus and students working with them on research aspects of gaming. So that's the Institute for uh, Virtual Environments and Computer Games. Um, and third, certainly not least, is the Video Game Developers Club, which has kind of been a robust presence developing games and keeping games at the forefront here uh, for about 10 years or so. A long time. So, um, so we're really excited that those three groups have come together. Um, also want to uh, especially thank Blizzard uh, as a sponsor of Game Day and more substantially as a sponsor of all of the game activity that's been going on at UCI. Uh, Blizzard provided mentors for the game development teams in the capstone course, uh, the fruits of the labors of which you will see. Um, I'm very excited about this. It's kind of a throwback to when my room was one of the most popular at MIT because I had an Atari system and, uh, <laughs> and associated games. So, so I'm really excited to, to see the product uh, of the student teams. I do want to um, say several thank yous. Um, first, the thank you is from me, actually, as Dean, uh, to uh, Magdal Zarki, Professor Magdal Zarki, and uh, Professor Dan Frost for their efforts in making game day a reality. So I hope you'll all join in. Um, and I would like to thank, kind of on my and their behalf, uh, some of the staff um, who really made this uh, happen. And you can't do any of this. There's a lot of logistics and things like this. So um, if the folks outside can hear me, uh, I want to thank Janet Ko and Anna Chang for their help organizing, Melody Lee for the t-shirt design that you see around, and Jason Chu for t-shirt production. So please, let's thank all those people. It would not have been As most of you know, there's a little program. We're going to see presentations of the nine capstone uh, projects from the CGS course. Um, and then after that, you'll have a chance to play these games, but others as well. That is, we have representatives from a couple of local game companies, uh, from the game, Video Game Developers Club, from the fall game jam, from their fall game jam. I'm sure I'm forgetting one or more sources of games, but trust me, there'll be lots of games. Um, so um, I don't want to take more of your time. Um, I would say that. For, uh, one of the things I wanted to say in closing is that um, ICS, the School of Information Computer Sciences, very broad in terms of computing, a lot of excellence. But when I go out, and I'm going out tomorrow to a group that's the Society for Information Management to talk to a bunch of IT managers, I tell them kind of about three themes that we in the school think are going to be central going forward. Um, and they are uh, big data, of course. Um, health and technology is very significant for us. Um, but games is the third, and it's games, as you'll see here, the entertainment games, but it's games writ large. That is, games as they show up in <coughs> education and training, games as they are now showing up in the ways companies try to manipulate us through games, um, all kinds of good stuff. Um, but so understanding games, developing games is, is, gonna, is with us now and will be for a, a long time to come. So that's one of the reasons I'm very excited to be here for the first game today. 
And welcome, everyone. Enjoy your evening. OK. Thank you. So I'll start off with one really exciting announcement. The men's room on the fifth floor is not working. <laughs> so just to let you know now, but we have men's rooms on every other floor, so sixth floor, fourth floor. There will be events after this. We'll be eating on the sixth floor, but there'll also be games and other stuff on the fourth and fifth floor. So don't just eat. Go down and play games as well. Um, I also thank you for thanking people, Hal. I also want to thank Richard Wang, my co-instructor for the Capstone Game class, um, and Bobby Farmer, who's videotaping right now and also did the, the logo that you see, you see up here. Um, Okay, so we're going to follow, hear from each uh, game team in the order that you have in your program. So we'll start with Belmix. Uh, please let us know if the volume is too loud. Uh, so we are the Fighting Mongooses, and this is our game, Belmix Tactics. Uh, we have General and Artist, uh, Ryan Torres, uh, Creative Lead and Environment Artist. Jonathan Stevens, UI artist and programmer, and uh, Justin Saleta, uh, programmer as well, uh, and I am the uh, Connor Richards, uh, the producer and a level designer. Uh, so this is a top-down uh, 2D tactics game. Um, it was derived from a tabletop uh, game that we that uh, Brian had developed, um, and so we virtualized it, uh, added some features, and uh, we are very proud of what has come up. So if you want to get started. Uh, first, you'll notice uh, a bit of the music in the game. Uh, every track is originally composed by Ryan as well. Uh, we have some music phasing uh, when going in and out of combat, uh, so you'll be able to hear that a bit in the first map. Um, we have various races, uh, which all have their own special bonuses and backgrounds, um, which give you starting gear. Um, so you can really personalize how you want to start out. We have paper dolls as well as uh, an image of the in-game model, uh, which changes depending on however you want to look. Uh, hairstyle, uh, primary colors, pant colors, uh, all that good stuff to look how you want. Uh, then we have a lot of classes as well. Each one is uh, very unique with their abilities and their core uh, features. Uh, every single one has its own place in the game uh, and feels very unique. Uh, that was one of our favorite parts was playing through as different classes and actually realizing that you had to strategize differently whether you were attacking people's composure uh, or attacking people's health or laying down traps and turrets. Uh, speaking of composure and health, uh, we have a, a two-pronged health system in this game, which is very unique, where you have the normal health, which dictates, dictates when you basically die. Uh, and then you have composure, which once it hits zero, you go into a primal state, which is determined by your race. Uh, in those states, you can't control your character, but if you do it to an enemy, they can't control themselves either. Uh, so it really adds a lot, and sometimes going into a primal state is actually worse than death because you'll be hitting your allies. We have various skills uh, that determine attributes and uh, other combat mechanics, as well as uh, uh, examining and looting and all that good stuff. So we'll, we'll make Cecilia Baker uh, an engineer. So we start off in the base. Uh, this is your base of operations. You'll go here after every mission. Uh, you can heal up in the infirmary if any people get damaged. Uh, you can hire new adventurers uh, to join your party. Um, you can save the game, go to a black market, uh, and buy stuff. Uh, because of the background that we chose, we start with a lot of money, but no here. Uh, so we'll start by buying a shoulder piece to uh, increase our defenses. Then you can also inspect all the people in your party, change around their gear, add stuff. And, uh, we start with a turret as well. So we'll just go into the first map. The back alley. Uh, so we just have a, a quick little tutorial thing. You can read about anything that you might want to know about the gameplay, or you can just jump right in. Uh, and then once you close that, you can bring it up at any time if you have questions about stuff that's coming up in the game. So our combat system uh, it starts right now, there are no enemies, so you just free roam, kind of search around, and the objective just popped up, which is get to the exit. So we're going to want to try to do that. So 
So we had a lot of fun making this game, and there's a lot of cool features that we're really proud of, including the conversation editor, uh, which allowed us to bring dialogue into the levels. Uh, it's it's uh, it's an adult game. Let's go with that. There, there might be a, a bit foul language, but it, it's a rough area. Uh, and it wasn't just typing in the dialogue and letting it happen. Uh, Justin actually created a, or uh, Ryan's brother actually created a conversation editor, uh, which linked nodes and uh, responses so that we were able to develop story however we wanted and add it to triggers in the world. Um, but Justin also, uh, to create these levels, Justin made a tile editor as well. Uh, for And he kept adding features and more features and more features so we could mass produce these levels of by adding visibility. Uh, there's a really great, really great line of sight mechanic, uh, which that enemy just saw us, so that'll be the end. Uh, but we didn't start with a weapon, so we're going to loot this dead body and take a dagger so we'll be able to do some, some decent damage. So the turns in this game, it's not just all of your characters and then all of their characters. Uh, it's every person has their individual uh, turn order. Uh, and we're also very proud of the AI for all of the enemies. <laughs> They uh, they do quirky things and really catch up catch us off guard uh, because of all their various tactics. Uh, that one got a little scared from all the damage we were doing, so we kept throwing us in throwing our main character into our companion character and knocking us down to uh, try and get us to stop hurting him. It didn't really work that well. So we're gonna move up and, and try and take out these two thugs that uh, are a little mad that we just killed their friend. We have various mechanics uh, other than just hitting people. Uh, there's also vaulting over rough, ter rough terrain. Um, you have one of the skills is athletics, which uh, allows you to be a lot more mobile and mobile in the environment. Uh, and uh, then our mechanic skill allows us to do more damage with traps and turrets that we deploy. The engineer starts with one, but if you find parts in the environment by looting, uh, or if you buy items from the black market with the money you earn from completing missions, uh, you can create your own traps and turrets and deploy them. Uh, but the engineer gets a little buffs for, for being an engineer. So with the last enemy dead, the music phases and we go back into scouting mode. Uh, we're going to pick up our turrets so that we can take it on the next mission after this. Because uh, if you just leave it there when you leave the level, then it's going to go away. So we're actually going to try and sneak around these guys up here, because there seems to be three of them, and they look pretty beefy, uh, especially compared to the guys we just fought. They uh, did a bit of damage to us. So we're going to try to sneak past them without being alerted. Because we also have stealth, which is a great skill. And so stealth combined with the athletics allowed us to take the high road around them, hopefully go unseen, and make it to the exit, which appears to be those stairs. So we're going to go way around, just because uh, they are patrolling enemies. Um, even if they don't move, they will change their line of sight uh, and rotate around. Oh, and they saw us. But if we can still get to those stairs and end the turn, then we'll be able to make it out alive. <laughs> oh no, they're blocking us. Oh no! <laughs> we might have to fight. And these are the kind of situations that uh, make it really exciting, where we went through this once and we were able to make it fun go through it this time, and they completely block the exit. <laughs> but we were able to make it out, and we'll return to base with our winnings. So with that, uh, we got some money, uh, we got some experience. Uh, so we can go to the uh, barracks and see if we can make them level up. We can't quite yet. Um, so maybe after another mission, we'd be able to level up and allocate more skill points and get another class feature for uh, an ability. But uh, we were a little hurt, so we might want to go to the infirmary, heal up a bit. And then we can show off uh, just the beginning of another level. Yeah, a little bit more time left. <coughs> so this is a warehouse. Uh, we start with two extra companions there because it's a little bit tougher. Uh, and now that you you know kind of get the hang of things, you might be able to survive a bit. Might. So we just marked uh, the um, enemy up there, so you get bonuses to hit. After taking that heavy turret shot, uh, she's very scared and is running away into the corner. So yeah, we have dynamic AI, uh, dynamic music, 
Uh, lots of fun situations to, to run into. Various classes, the change of combat. Uh, really satisfying blood splatter as well. And uh, we've had a lot of fun making it. We've had a lot of fun playing it. Um, yeah, that's uh, Bell Next Tactics. Uh, oh, and we'd also really like to thank our uh, mentors throughout this quarter for, for helping us out, uh, giving us a lot of great direction at the beginning and uh, helping us focus in the end. Uh, Lee Sparks, um, Paul Foster, uh, Grant Mark, and Simon Fouche. Okay. All right. Uh, if there are any questions uh, while we're packing up and the next group is uh, setting up, uh, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay. Thank you, Fighting Mongooses and Team X. Come on up. So, uh, any questions? Yes. Um, how long in total did you work on this one? Uh, so this, uh, this you the course. Oh, no, and, and, and move out of the way so that can move back. So he was asking, how long have we worked on this game? Uh, well, the course itself was uh, 20 weeks. Uh, Ryan had developed the game over a year ago uh, as a tabletop, and we had been playing it for uh, about a year. Um, and so all over that time, we had developed the design of the game, uh, the, the features of the game, at least for a uh, tabletop setting, uh, with the campaign and the setting and all the classes and abilities and balance it for that. So a lot of it was already set in stone by the time we wanted to transfer it into a virtual game in 20 weeks. But there were a lot of uh, issues that come, came up. Some things didn't transfer well from tabletop to virtual. And then some features we were actually able to add because of that reason as well. Um, so yeah, 20 weeks for the game. But uh, the tabletop has been going on for a lot longer. And we're actually going to continue that for a while as well. Any other questions? Okay. All right. I hand it over to. Oh, uh, one more question. What didn't work out? What was the thing that was the hardest to do? Uh, so of course there are always issues. Um, the the most obvious one is you know time. Uh, you never finish a game. Uh, you only ship a game. Um, so you know that really hit hard when we had all these things we wanted to do, and of course we we're able to do them. But uh, being able to see what we got in the end was really great because uh, it's still a fun product that we had enjoyed uh, had enjoyment in playing, which was fantastic. Um, but we probably the, the worst part was we didn't get the conversation editor until like four days ago. Uh, so you know I think it's time. Oh yeah, of course. Uh, but yeah, we love the game and it was fun. People who are standing in the corner, lots of seats here. Please come on in, or not in the doorway, I mean. Come on, sit on here, sit here. You can sit next to me if you want. Hi, um, my name is Ted. This is Max, Tommy, Hector, and Anthony. Collectively, we are Team X, and we've spent the last couple of months uh, building this game, um, Block Buddies. Now, basically, it's a, um, it's a match three type puzzle game where the whole point is you're just matching blocks, trying to get combos, get points, all that fun stuff. And um, we uh, basically we were inspired a lot by Tetris Attack. If you've ever played that before, it's uh, kind of similar to what we did. Um, and the uh, kind of the big thing that we added to that was uh, in Tetris Attack you can only swap pieces that are like next to each other horizontally. And we kind of felt it would be more fun to have a little bit more control over the board, so we made it so you could swap in all four directions, which um, kind of uh, changed up the way the game played a bit. So some of the stuff that was in Tetris Attack that was really easy and got a little trickier to do, and vice versa. So um, basically, we uh, at the start we didn't we decided we didn't want to write a game using any specific engine. We just kind of wanted to code it all as ourselves as much as possible in C plus plus. So uh, that kind of explains the unique look of the thing and we um, we also uh, use SFML to um, I mean for it, it's not an engine it's a, more of a library to display like uh, graphics sounds it has a little bit of networking stuff in there as well so that's kind of how we put this all together so okay. so um, this is the game here Let's see. 
So the um, goal is to match three or more, so match three, match four, match five. So that's basically the game plan. And every couple of seconds, the row at the bottom is going to like bump the ball out. Once it gets to the top, get over. Uh, yeah, as of right now, it's set up running in a client server configuration. So the um, all the game is really doing is displaying all the information that's on the server, all the actual computation, all that good stuff that's happening on my machine at home in Lake Forest. And we were kind of, um, with something like this where like timing is pretty sensitive, we were a little worried about lag and you know that sort of thing making it unplayable, but I mean, it's playing just fine and we're really happy with that, proud of it. So then we also have a multiplayer setup where two people are playing head to head, and you'll be able to see an example of that here. In a moment. So the um, the matchmaking I mean, at this point is pretty crude. It's just if there's someone else in the queue, we get matched up. So. <laughs> Now, uh, multiplayer is a little different. If you, um, I mean, matching three will clear the uh, blocks that you got, but if you match four or more, you start sending the junk to your opponent. So the idea is the bigger the combos you get, the more junk you send. So it's a good strategy there. Oh, and also, as the blocks get up closer to the top, you can see there's kind of animations to warn you about that. Now the, uh, the, me the mentors from Blizzard gave us a lot of really good advice on how to structure this, like um, which parts should be handled by the server, which parts should be handled by the clients, um, way techniques for doing these kinds of animations, a lot of really helpful information, saying that without them it wouldn't be nearly as fun product as it is now. Oh, there's four right there. Got it. <laughs> okay, so yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> So if you go to your profile, we also keep track of your stats, like high score, uh, games played, all that good stuff. So that's all stored on the same database as the server running on. So fun stuff. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, play to win productions, come on up. Any questions for Team X while they're Team X move away from the podium? Questions? Sorry, did you guys do original music for that? Not oh, yeah, we did. <laughs> uh, we, we, we had a serious lack of creative people, artists and musicians, so we just took everything off the internet. <laughs> we made the, the blocks, though. Oh, the blocks? No, that, that was all me. I'm the artist for the script. <laughs> uh, what's done on the server and what's done on the client? Um, all the game logic is handled on the server side. All the, the pretty fancy stuff is client side. Um, database requests are all server side handled. Uh, and matchmaking is all handled server side as well. OK, let's hand it over to, oh, one more. So what, what's next? You, you only had, you said, a couple of weeks or so, a couple of months. Uh, well, well, basic question. You know what? That's you know what? Let's. You can ask that downstairs. We're going to move on to the next team. We got. Got to keep with the schedule. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, hey everyone. Uh, we are Play to Win Productions, and our game is Guardians of the Arena. 
My name is Joey Shepard. I'm the producer of this game. Uh, to my right is Jordan Waugh. He is the graphics programmer. Daniel Tenorio here is server engineer and database manager to our game is Network. And uh, Stephen Kawafuchi is the uh, client side programmer and dealt with game logic, UI, all that stuff on the client side. So without further ado, uh, let's just log into our game. Uh, you're sent to the main menu as soon as you log in. And from there, you can see a list of players that are logged in on the very right, as well as a, a chat log for you to message other users online, discuss strategy, um, you know, invite them to play you. So the list of players online is on the right. Here's our chat window, which pops up and allows you to chat with them. Uh, our game is, uh, to give you an overview, it's like chess and stratego, in the sense that it's a 2D tile-based and turn-based game where the goal is to eliminate a specific piece. So in chess, it'd be like a king. In our game, it is the soul stone. So the soul stone's an immobile structure, and it's a unit you place on the field. So head over to the setup boards. And uh, so the soul stone is this immobile structure, and if you if it gets destroyed, you lose. So your goal is to protect it. Uh, but it's also the guardian's job to protect it. So what's the guardian? The guardian is also another unit on the game board. And until the guardian dies, your soul stone is invulnerable. So really, the game becomes protect your guardian. Now the guardian has very heavy combat stats, so you know you're not always going to want to hide it in the back. You, can, you shouldn't be afraid to just throw it in the front lines and let it do damage. Um, the reason that we have a set of boards thing before the game is before the game starts is because we want the players to be able to create any unit composition you want, and this is where the stratego element comes in. Because before the game even starts, before you see your opponent set up at all, uh, you get to decide what units you want and where you want to put them on the map. So if you want uh, an entire range composition with units that just attack from afar, go ahead and do that. If you want to use priests to heal your units because you want to play more defensive style, you're free to do that as well. The two divisions are for the top segment is the battlefield where you uh, your units will be placed in the game if they're on the battlefield. And if they're on the sideline or the stash, the bottom part, those are the units on the bench. So you're only allowed to take a certain amount of units into combat with you, and it's up to you which ones you want to take with you and which ones you want to leave on the sideline. Uh, there are some restrictions, like you cannot remove your soul stone or guardian because those are the win conditions of the game, so those have to remain on the field. Other than that, it's up to you. Um, it's, a, it's totally free uh, for player's choice. So uh, we're going to head into a uh, AI game right now. And so the AI mode is just single player, and the AI mirrors whatever setup you chose and plays versus you with it. So uh, it plays awfully aggressively, and it sends its units right at you to attack you and beat you down. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the terrain now for Guardians of the Arena. You'll see barrels as well as black rocks. The black rocks are invincible and indestructible terrain, so you have to work your way around them. It's just part of the strategy. The barrels are, are destructible. So break them with any unit that deals damage and use it to flank your opponent. Uh, so when we were first developing this game, we started out by, it is networked, but we started developing a, a local client copy first, which would just run on one machine. And once we got the game logic in the game and we were comfortable with the balance of the units and uh, the turns and everything, we then sent it uh, across the network and had the network verify all the information that was being sent. So if you were trying to move, if you somehow modded the game or, or intercepted a packet and decided to send your unit further than it should be allowed to be sent, the server would deny that and say you can only move a certain distance. And uh, so that's to prevent cheating and make sure that the server and client stay in sync. Uh, so yeah, so we'll uh, save you the time and uh, go into a PvP game right now. The A is there as sort of a tutorial mode. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's not very novice. It's actually beaten a couple of our playtesters, but it's also not there to be super competitive. You'll, you'll, you'll play it once or twice and pick up the game pretty easily. So once you head into PvP, uh, as, soon as, as soon as the client, or the server, as soon as two clients uh, enter the queue on the server side, it just takes them out and puts them in a game together, so there's no matchmaking rating or anything fancy like that. But um, it, it will just take the first two clients that connect, um, pull them off the queue, throw them in a game together. 
And uh, so one thing that we wanted to talk about is early in development. We had kind of looked, looked over a lot of um, software design techniques that were otherwise helpful. And our Blizzard mentors from Fall Quarter, Ben and Jesse, uh, had brought up the concept of paper, paper prototyping with us, which we had totally overlooked. We thought we had the game programmed in a computer. We were just going to you know, dive right in and start designing um, things, or start designing uh, combat tactics and stuff. But uh, when we did do paper prototyping, we found that there was a mechanic in the game that we totally took out completely, and that was armor. So prior to testing the game uh, with a paper prototype to get, get all the math right and all the numbers right, we had a mechanic in the game where units would take reduced damage based on their armor. And every unit had a certain amount of armor, so 10 armor would be 10% damage reduction. And uh, quickly we find out that taking damage mitigation into account while you're calculating uh, the, the amount of damage you could do to a single unit in one turn, given how much mana you have, uh, became quite number intensive, math intensive. And we ended up nicknaming the game during that stage of production, uh, Mathematicians of the Arena, because it was that hard to uh, figure out how much damage you'd be doing. So we actually, as a result of paper prototyping, scrapped the idea entirely. And now if you do 10 damage, you just do 10 damage. Uh, you're given a resource mana that you can spend through, uh, by moving or attacking with your units. So it caps at eight maximum mana, so you're allowed to do unit combinations up to up to eight mana. Some attacks are cheap, some are more expensive, but you can combo them together if you have enough mana. So unlike chess, where you're only allowed to move one piece and that's it, your turn's over, and then your opponent moves a piece, you can move as many pieces and attack with as many pieces as your mana allows. Uh, and then another problem we ran into later on in development was information clarity. So players, um, for example, didn't know when it was their turn, which that's pretty important in a turn-based game. So they'd be trying to move pieces while it was their opponent's <laughs> turn. Uh, they didn't know how far they could move a unit or what um, bonuses they got when they leveled up. So that's another thing we added, which was unit veterancy. Uh, and that means that units can level up during combat. So as they deal damage, or if, say, a healing unit heals a unit, uh, it gets experience. And once you reach a certain experience threshold, it levels up and gains bonus abilities. So like, for example, the archer normally shoots an arrow and the first target it hits takes damage. However, it can gain the piercing arrow effect. And if it shoots four tiles ahead, all four tiles will get hit no matter what, if there's a three or four or five or three or four enemies uh, along those tiles. Um, and, and so uh, our, our mentors for this quarter, Aaron and Brian, um, really brought to light that whole uh, information clarity thing that I was talking about. Uh, we didn't have a visual indicator for mana even, and uh, the time is cut off on, on this screen, but the timer was also obscure and hard to recognize when you're running out of time. So turn timers would just end and players wouldn't realize that their turn had ended, all that sort of stuff. So we want to thank them for really helping polish our game and bring uh, information clarity to the forefront. Uh, so as soon as the Guardian dies, uh, the Soul Stone starts glowing red, uh, and, and like lava flows out of that, that uh, the structure, and that's when you realize that it's vulnerable, and it's like, and uh, you're, close to, you're close to losing. All right, so with, uh, with that said, we're playing with Productions. This is Guardians of the Arenas. Thank you for your time. Team Jay? Right. Team Jay? Come on up. Any, Any questions in? for we'll questions now? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, where did you get the idea uh, for your aesthetics and who made the art? Uh, so the art is, uh, we, art, we don't have a, an artist on our team, so we strip art sprites from online. And I believe all of the art we are used was from uh, Diablo 2, uh, early PC version. So. Yes. Uh, were there any games that influenced your system's design? So our big influence was uh, Tactics Arena Online, which is where we got the idea for a tile-based, uh, turn-based game. A few of our uh, the other members, like fa Final Fantasy Tactics, and uh, in both of those games, you, you're only allowed to move one unit, and there's 
cooldowns for units being used, and we didn't like that. We felt that the pace of gameplay was too slow, so we allowed a mana resource system and allowed you to move <coughs> upwards of six, seven units per turn and attack with uh, the majority of them, which we felt was more gratifying. And games would end a lot, a lot sooner. Any questions? Okay. All right. Thank you. <coughs> All right, hello everyone. Um, my name is Jason. I'm the producer for my team. Um, that uh, Sam is a 2D artist. Alec is a programmer. Nathan, who's setting things up, he's the creative lead and the designer. And Max is another programmer. And on the end, we have Chase, who is an artist, a 3D artist from Santa Ana College, who is involved in developing the environment and the characters. And we have uh, four other team members. Uh, Zach and Jesse and Garfield and Carlos, who could not be here this evening with us, and they're from Santa Ana College, and they are generating the assets. <clears throat> they generated a bunch of the assets for our game. And so our game is Engineering We Have a Problem. <coughs> it is a 2D, <coughs> excuse me, a 2D physics puzzle game, and you, the character you play as is the junior engineer, and she is on the intergalactic planetary fleet vessel Icarus, and her task involves cleaning and putting out fires and troubleshooting and generally just keeping the systems running so that the, the ship can operate while it's deployed. <laughs> Episode one, the vacuum menace. And here, here we have a tutorial section that's been developed and you know basic walking and jumping. And here we have um, the incomplete asset. It's actually a power switch to a door. And we have power switches um, for doors and also for platforms that can move and other things. And where because of the fact that we work with Professor uh, Patricia Waterman over at Santa Ana College, our game is actually, you know, it's finished as far as the capstone is concerned, but we do plan on continuing to create something for game's sake and possibly continue beyond that. And so well, one of the new uh, elements we have is the power switches to power just a bunch of different things for, for, um, for creating puzzles. So moving forward, um, she, she's equipped with an engineering tool that operates as a vacuum at the moment, and the, the primary element that we work with is called Explodium. And Explodium is the universal power source and lubricant for everything, except that it is highly flammable. And so here, the, um, this is a sur surface mechanic system that was developed. There are no calculated nodes all along the floor of the walls, and when the grime is sprayed, it can detect when it's nearby a node, and then the, the, the node, the grime value of that node gets increased. And the way we're working with that is that grime, the exploding grime can be affected by fire, can be affected by frost, and then uh, we, for future implementation, we plan on having you know, poisonous mold and electricity that are also affect grime. And so there, there is a tremendous back-end system that just went into getting this basic fire and grime system that you see here. And it took a long time to build, and Alec and Max put a lot of effort into it, and this is the, the product that you can see. And there's some fire and the hazard associated with that. And now the, this is the map of the ship, and it shows where she is and all the rooms that have been implemented so far. And we do have additional resources that for creating additional rooms, including navigations and a control center. And the artists actually have provided us a, a giant 3D rotary planet planet view of a star system, and we are going to put that in and have it be rotating, and it's going to look really great. And so more power systems, and then this is a teleporter to lead into the control bridge of the ship. And this is the beginning of day one, and that's the commanding officer. And <coughs> And he says, good morning, junior engineer. Welcome aboard the IPA FB Icarus. Your task as junior engineer is to keep the engineer ears clean and working order. And so now this begins the puzzling element of progressively being given certain tasks and going and accomplishing those tasks. And the, fir the first couple of episodes of gameplay are relatively simple because it's not really anything complex. But as more episodes get on, it's going to be you know, go and do something, and then you go and try and do it. You find out that uh, the platform needs to be activated, and the fire needs to put out. And so, the the system of episode development is going to get progressively more complex. And 
So here you can see on the on the right, he's got the uh, the current objective is to clean, and it, it gives the percentage that it needs to be finished. And then once the task is complete, he goes into the engine room with the reactor core to talk to the engineer. And so that was episode one, which is basically an introduction to the vacuum mechanic and the grind system and just getting a feel for the keyboard, the keyboard mouse controls gameplay. And then we have uh, the teleporting system, which took a while to implement and um, for transitioning because this is actually, um, each room is an independent unity scene. And so when it transitions, it's actually changing unity scenes. And it also does the 2D camera shift. Uh, and so, here, here, she is, here she is running through the fire. And so, yeah, day, day two is basically fire exists and it hurts you, but you don't have the ability to do anything about it. And now we get into crime and punishment, which is where the player gets. You know, now you are certified for fire control training because that, you know, the, the previous gameplay that you saw as a requirement for being certified for fire uh, fire control training. And as as far as development goes, um, because of all the response that we got from our fantastic mentors, which were uh, Tim and Simon in fall, and then in this past quarter it was Ben and Helen. Um, we never really got very far beyond the alpha because we realized that there were a lot of things as far as teaching people how to play the game and giving them objective clarity and the, the navigation the navigation system of the ship. And actually for an entire quarter we didn't have that. And so anybody who played our game, if they were playing it the first time, they were asking us where to go. And then if they were playing it beyond the first time, they just had it memorized and so they went to where it was required. And so um, and through playtesting we learned that <laughs> and now she has been killed. <laughs> so that is her being killed by fire. And so <clears throat> that's the, um, the, the development. Like I said, we, we have assets that haven't been put in yet, but that's because with working with the artists from Santa Ana College, we plan on continuing this through Game Saver farther. And we have. Um, Additional ideas for episodes and additional storyline that is going to be implemented later. But for what we have for Capstone, this is the, the stopping point that we have right now. <coughs> and this is our game, Engineering We Have a Problem. Okay. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. And next to you? Who's next? That's us. Okay. Well, answer questions while they while they. Did anyone have any questions? Yeah. Oh, yes. Did you develop any tools in order to help you paste nodes and such and design the levels? Okay. The there. Yeah. <laughs> you want to talk about that, Alan? Um. The way the system is set up is there are a series of tiles that you can place. Um, in the levels initially, and each of them has nodes. Um, but then there's a series of algorithms that'll run when the level is prepped, so it gets baked out to an, uh, a different scene, and it's like prefixed with a different uh, um, marker so that you know that it's been baked out. And then at that point, it calculates the connectivity of all the nodes so the fire can propagate. Um, and it also gets rid of redundant nodes when there's overlaps uh, between the uh, uh, tiles and whatnot. Okay. Okay. Right. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Um, my name is Robert. Uh, this is Grant, uh, Cedro, Kai, Nathan, Cameron, Tyler, Jonathan. I was kind of saw the names. I'm forgetting them already. <laughs> um, we're like half. Like everyone kind of stepped in and everything on our game. Um, but our producers were. Oh, we didn't, we didn't organize this. Uh, our producer was uh, Tyler. Uh, designers were Cameron, Kai, and me, and then everyone else was programming. And and everyone else cast it into everyone else's roles. Um, we had artists at LCAT, yeah. Uh, they made everything from that you can see on the screen, aside from our buttons, because that was Jonathan's awesome programming art. Uh, 
And then we have a friend at UCLA who uh, did our music for us. So our menu music was made by him, and he did all of our in-game music too. Um, and so our game is a 2D platformer where you're climbing on a Goliath. Uh, so Cameron's going to get started. Um, our first few levels, we try to introduce the player into all of the uh, basic mechanics. So this level is just about jumping and moving. You can move in the game if you can. What would be the point? Um, and then off the, uh, there's a door off the screen. Uh, there's something about this one that doesn't like us. Uh, then we implemented a, uh, a grapple mechanic. And so that's a grapple point. When you can see it, it'll highlight it with that, um, with that blue crosshair. And sometimes you can jump to reach them, and when you throw it out, it kind of slows down your falling speed. So there's no, there's never a point in time where you start to grapple, and then you lose it because you fell out of the range. And we're really, I'm really proud of that personally because it makes for the game experience to be a lot better, as opposed to like you shoot it out and you just can't get it. And you're like, well, this sucks, and I can go do this all over again. Um, uh, one of the things we're really proud of about our game is the grapple because. Uh, we actually didn't work with any physics engines, so Jonathan actually put in uh, the physics to do all the grappling and where you end up when you grapple the stuff. So that's one of the things that we're really proud of in our game. Uh, also, in the last level, you saw that there are spikes. Uh, so originally in our game, we were planning on doing kind of a... Uh, well, it is a David versus Goliath. Our main character, David, is going to later be shown on a Goliath. But originally, we were planning to have an AI, but then... Uh, our mentors, uh, mostly Wyatt and Lee for this part, they uh, they told us about like, you know, ma what makes your game fun? And we figured out it was our grappling. And the AI was kind of just a side thing and we're like, yeah, it's okay. Uh, but we could take it out and we could put in like environmental hazards and it would be a lot more fun. Um, so in this little, you see the arrow shooters and stuff like that is the environmental hazard that we feel added a lot more to our game than our basic AI did. Yeah, so our previous level was to showcase the spikes, and uh, Cameron didn't fall into them because he thinks he's too good. Um, but they will insta-kill you, and the arrows, as you saw, only deal one damage. And the top left is our uh, player's health. Take it, take it, get hit by one. So it takes damage, and then he picks up the treasure chest, then he'll get back to full health. So a treasure chest uh, restores one, one part of health for you. Um, and so this level kind of ties together all the mechanics that we've shown the players so far. They're all the ones we really have. Um, and so, as I said, this is a game where you're on a Goliath, and you're like, well, there's not a Goliath there. Uh, because this is a tutorial level, it's meant to get you used to the game. And now, no, not now. There's still another level. <laughs> we'll get to the Goliath eventually, I promise. Um, so here's another one, just being speedrun. Uh, we, we play tested this game for hours. We had a, a clarity jam. Um, let's that <laughs> okay. uh, So we had a clarity jam one weekend. We just got together to do the game jam. Our uh, our mentor said, hey, we need you guys to like focus on clarity, make sure the player knows what's going on, they can see what they're doing. Um, and so that's where we ended up getting like all these levels that kind of help you see what each thing does. And now you're on the Goliath. Uh, and this was part of our clarity jam where we decided what can you do that'll make the uh, the player sit there on the glide. So we have a uh, parallaxing background, um, and so if you know what that is, it's you've got multiple layers in the background moving at different speeds. So it gives you that perspective that you're on this this thing and it's moving up and down because you're on the leg, and the background is moving in the distance, so you can see that things are moving past in the background there. And every time you hit the Goliath, which is a uh, custom grapple point, you grapple to it, and we don't have the animation in yet, but when you uh, grapple to it, you hold on, and then you grab into it with the other arm. That's the button. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's cool. Uh, so the animation would be that he reaches into the uh, thing and pulls out some wires and causes some sparks, and then the, uh, the grapple point is gone, you can't use it again. Um, and every time he gets hit, uh, you see the screen shakes a little bit, and uh, there's the, the growling, which kind of tells the player, back, going back to clarity, hey, you, you hit the Goliath, you're doing something to it. And so the objective is to get to the top and take out the, uh, the three points, which, um, can you, did the picture of the Goliath actually show up? Or is it cut off? Oh, there it is. So you can see uh, on the right that we've got the picture of like the Goliath as a whole, and then you've got the, uh, 
the weak spots is that your objective is to destroy the weak spots on that level before you move forward. And the weak spots are illustrated there. And there's a little red dot that tells you where on the glide you are. Go ahead and resume. Okay. So now we're going to go to the face because um, that's the top level. This is like the final area. Um, Cameron went designed all these glide levels and made sure to put in a lot of arrows so you get destroyed if you mess up once. Um, and so this, this kind of gets to our whole, like see right there, that grapple point disappears, so if you were to fall back down after this, you would have to essentially start over because that grapple point's gone now, so you need to reset that level. So that beats the uh, Goliath level. Uh, I'll go ahead and answer some questions though, because that's kind of everything about our game. Well, Cameron played some extra levels that he made uh, that we all really like. Or can't have some questions. <laughs> so, so as as Cameron is showing off his levels, our our engine is like it's pretty much just a nice two D platform engine. So we could swap out whatever art assets we want to make levels such as our Mario level, and uh, I think he has a Mega Man level. But um, yeah, it's it's really. Like our engine, our engine, we we use SFML and C plus plus, but we had to build all the physics and stuff from scratch. So that's mostly what we're proud of in our game is that we went through the entire iterative process of going through and then having to refactor our stuff when it didn't work. So if anyone has any questions, I guess we'll take take some questions. No, we'll keep playing. Okay. <laughs> Oh, oh. What's the hardest part about writing your engine? Or rather, why do you choose to write your own engine as opposed to using pre built on like Unity or So, I mean, it's not fair to say that we wrote our, all, our whole engine because we did use like a graphics and input library, but we did decide to write all the physics and stuff ourselves because we wanted the experience in mostly C and stuff like that. So, it was mostly a learning experience on our, on our part instead of just like we really need to get something done. We really just wanted to learn. Okay. Hey there, everybody. We are Team Volcano, and we built we built a game <coughs> called uh, Fallen Kingdom, which is a uh, puzzle-based uh, battle game. We took some of the principles of games like Bejeweled, where you match three gems and you know, more gems fall down. And then uh, sort of typical RPG style battle. So uh, we we got you starting off this game playing as a character called Victor, your uh, warrior whose kingdom has been taken from him by a horde of demons. And you are there to battle the forces of nature and the undead and demons to take it back. So uh, let's... Uh, Get it started. We have gameplay footage of our game because we uh, unfortunately couldn't get it to uh, stream to a computer very easily. So uh, we've got our splash screen here. And um, oh, first, pardon me, let me introduce everybody. So I'm Rex, the, uh, a programmer. This is Jonathan, a designer. Robin, programmer. Brianna, producer. Valentin, programmer. And Michael, designer. And uh, Let's get it started. So we currently, uh, that was our, uh, so like Rex said, that we, we have a video instead of live. We were having some um, streaming issues with live. So we decided instead of showing you something that's two minutes behind what we're talking about, we'd like to actually show you what we're talking about. So what you just saw, this is our loading screen. That is not our loading uh, screen. <laughs> One more time. I loaded it to my desktop just in case this happened. Okay, here we go. So this is our loading screen, and then. And so this is our loading screen, and we currently have four levels, a uh, tutorial, and then we have easy, medium, and hard. So this is our tutorial level. 
And this is where the player learns the basic mechanic. You match three or more gems in order to attack the enemy. And the more gems you attack, uh, the more gems you use, the higher the attack. Also, each enemy, each enemy has a weakness. So you can see right about here, <laughs> they each have a color. And that color that shows is the color that they're weak to. So when you match that color against them, it's going to be double damage. Oh, it was running in Okay, and then this is the medium level. During the medium level, we introduce the zombie. And each, the thing is that each enemy has each enemy has a turn counter right here. And it shows how long until they attack you. And so you kind of have to prioritize, do I attack the enemy that's going to do more damage or the one that's going to do first, which do I do? So for example, the zombie, it only does two damage. It's really, really weak, but it attacks you every single turn. So that presents the player with an interesting choice. So um, we also have multiple special gems. So that uh, the one that you just saw right there was a bomb. And the bomb does extra damage when you include it in a combo. Another one that we have is a healing potion. And the healing potion restores some of your health back, which is helpful in some of the later levels where you're getting a lot of damage done and you want to recover some of it. Another feature that we have is you can select which enemy you actually want to target. So um, in a second here, this is going to be defeated, and then there's going to be a new way with multiple enemies. And so you can see right there, they just change the select from the very top one, which is the default, to the one in the middle. So let's say you only have a, a combo of orange gems. You don't want to use that against the zombie because the zombie, but, but when the imp is actually weak to it, so you can target the imp instead. So they, uh, your attack more effectively. And let's see. So the hard level. So currently our hard level has what would be the end of the section. So in this case, like the, the forest area. In which case the boss is an alpha wolf that has a lot more health, does more damage, and it only attacks every four turns. That's not the alpha wolf, it's a velocity. You can see what wave you're at. Very, at the very top left of the screen, but you're in the wave two out of the three wave. Vicious looking wolf there. Um, that's the alpha wolf. You can see that he has 40 HP as opposed to the other's eight. So, considering each gem does one damage, except for the, what, the red ones, which against him are super effective, those are two. So, you can imagine that it's, it's a bit of work to defeat him because he, he's pretty heavy. So, um, so major, a couple of challenges. One of the things is we're really proud of having the <coughs> hexagonal gem board that I just paused so it's a little bit easier to show. But basically, <coughs> we decided to go with a hexagonal board because since this game is for Android, we were worried that we would have a really small screen and it would be kind of hard to uh, get a lot of good combinations and things like that. 
So by having the hexagonal board, instead of being able to go reach four gems, you automatically have six gems that you can reach. And that created a lot more combinations and allowed there to be a lot more with um, the smaller board that we had. So we would like to thank our mentors who were really helpful with helping us um, prioritize. So we wanted to thank, we had um, Craig Morrison, Anders, Kevin Calderon, Helen Chang, and then also Paul Foster for helping put this whole thing together. So we wanted to thank you a lot. And I think, uh, I think that's just about it. If anybody has any questions, we'd like to take them now. OK, why don't you take questions as Team K comes up? OK, that's good. Back there. Uh, where is the music from? The music uh, was from a database of free songs by <laughs> a person who makes uh, music specifically for uh, RPGs made by indie developers. Any other questions? Oh, right here. Uh, for the enemies attack, like they, they attack every uh, so many turns, is that number of moves you make or is it time? It's number of moves you make. So every time you draw a line through the gyms and then let go, the enemy turn counter is decremented by one. And so some enemies will have four turns, four of your turns until they attack, and some will have only one turn until they attack. Usually the ones with lower turn counters will do less damage, whereas like the uh, Alpha Wolf, for example, did, he was a hard hitter anyway. Any others right there? Did you use any engines, or did you have to like build up the uh, platform from scratch? So um, we used an Android-based game engine called And Engine. Uh, that was a pretty big learning curve for us. Uh, none of us had any experience with that particular game engine. But uh, we decided to take on that challenge this quarter, and uh, I'd say it was a good learning experience. Any others? All right. Well, then uh, I think I can hand it off to the next team. Thank you very much. Uh, we're Team K, and our game is called uh, Malefactor. And uh, our game is a little different from most in that it was developed specifically uh, to be used for research. And uh, we're interested in studying uh, criminal behavior um, and to see if uh, changes in the environment make players more likely to steal and if they learn from their mistakes and so on. Uh, we did work uh, with a team of uh, researchers, uh, Mike McBride, who is studying economics, George Tita, who is studying criminology, and one of their graduate students, Siwen Kong, who is studying experimental <coughs> economics. Um, so Eli has gone ahead and uh, started to play the game. So the objective that the players are given in the research environment is very simple, just to uh, go into the world and collect items and redeem them for money. And the objective is uh, to be kind of vague because they don't want to distinguish between whether or not they're stealing items or whether or not they're collecting clean items. So uh, there are various items in the game that they can pick up and uh, collect. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, Eli's going ahead and uh, exploring our world and uh, while the test subjects are playing, the researchers in the background can go ahead and look at all the live data that is being uh, just are being collected and uh, transferred to the server, uh, which is what our programmer Eli worked on, and uh, we are really proud of that because that is one of the main things that uh, the researchers needed, uh, is the data being collected from all the players who are playing the game. Um, so as you can see, he's taken up some items here. Um, if you open up your backpack, you can see uh, what items you currently have in your backpack. If you click on different ones, you'll see uh, their description prices. Um, and the world is designed to be completely uh, symmetrical. So we have one world that's kind of like a poor area and one, uh, one area that's more the rich uh, side of town. And they wanted to the poor area to mirror exactly the rich area to kind of see, uh, like I mentioned earlier, if the environment has an effect on whether or not they're more likely to steal. Um, there's one of our police officers in the game. We have uh, two police officers right now in the game. Um, if he if he sees you, he has a percentage chance to decide to search you. Um, if he sees you in the process of actually collecting a stolen item, then he will punish you immediately. Um, otherwise, you can see here, um, 
there was a mistake made. Uh, Eli didn't have anything that was dirty, so he was set to go on his way. Um, one funny story about this game is uh, our team is actually um, all girls and one guy, Eli. So the girls were working on the world building, and he was busy uh, programming the server and everything else. And um, we had spent time building the world, adding new character models and everything. And we sat down for a group meeting, and we wanted to show Eli all the stuff we'd added. So we sat him down to play test the game, and literally the first thing he did was walk up to the female NPC and start slapping her butt. So uh, <laughs> I guess it depends on who you are playing, uh, who is playing the game, that we didn't intend for that to be a distract distraction. But, um, <laughs> um, one of the things that we're really proud of um, on this project is we spent a lot of time improving the performance. Uh, these, this game is meant to be run on the research computers in the lab, so very, it must be very low, um, low performance base. And uh, when we first brought in our game to test on the computers, it had uh, severe lag issues. And uh, our mentor from Blizzard, Jesse Brophy, uh, helped greatly in um, helping us identify our issues. Uh, which were really high polygon models that we had added. Uh, we don't have an artist, so all the models that you're seeing uh, are pulled from, from online, and a lot of the models that artists put online for free are meant to be, uh, or are not optimized for games, so a lot of them are very high poly, uh, which is why um, the world is still a little bit empty. Uh, we're still working on finding uh, low polygon uh, objects <laughs> that we put into the game. You can see here, you like just found a laptop. <laughs> So um, this game is meant to be round based. So there are three rounds that the players, or four rounds that the players will have. The first round is a practice round, just for the players to get used to uh, the controls and uh, the navigation and uh, the mechanics of the game. Uh, one interesting thing to note is that the test subjects are, I guess the police officer didn't decide to search him. Um, he's lucky. Um, one of the interesting things is that the test subjects are actually paid in real money based on uh, a amount that they earned while playing the game. So uh, there is an incentive for the players to steal and collect items successfully without being caught. Um, so he has uh, 30 seconds left in the round. Um, he, he can go to the Redemption Center. Uh, there's a small mini-map in the top left-hand corner uh, that gives you a quick overview of how the map is laid out. Um, there's two redemption centers on the map, one in the poor area, one in the rich area, and they are marked by the stars on the mini-map um, to kind of help you locate them easier. Um, and now that Eli's filled up his backpack, there's a little notification that pops up that lets you know, hey, your backpack's full, so you should go uh, redeem all your stuff so you can make some money. And unfortunately, the round ended right before he was about to collect uh, because he was so mesmerized by how much money he was about to make. <laughs> uh, so right here, really quick, is the round summary screen. Um, all of the players will continue to play the round until reaching the screen, and players will reach this might reach the screen at a different time um, because when you're punished by a police officer, um, instead of deducting money because we didn't want to go into negative uh, funds because they're not going to be paying the researchers to play the game, it's off the other way around. So uh, we actually d deduct time as a form of punishment um, when they are caught. <laughs> <laughs> so there are various uh, fun items to, to find in the world. Uh, <laughs> so Eli's, Eli's trying really hard to, to get the cops to notice them, even though we, we set the percentage uh, relatively high chance for him to want to search you, because we want to show you that. Um, so while he's uh, continuing to, to play the game, I wanted to take a minute to um, to thank everybody who had a uh, had a big effect on helping us with this project. Um, thank you so much to the researchers for giving us the opportunity to work with you guys on this project. Thank you so much, Brian Kendrick and Wyatt Chang, for helping us uh, set up the foundation for the game during the first quarter. Uh, thank you to Paul Foster for helping us manage the tasks during uh, the beginning of this quarter. And uh, thank you, Jesse Brophy, again, for giving us advice on how to improve the game's performance. And lastly, thank you, Professor Frost, for helping organize all of this and giving us the opportunity to meet and work with these Blizzard uh, mentors.
Um, so as you can see, uh, he was busted uh, for having a stolen item. So uh, this was our quick UI setup uh, that tells you what items were removed, um, how much uh, how much they are worth, which is being cut off right now. And uh, depending on how much the items are worth is uh, related to how, how much you're penalized at times. So you can see uh, the time is stopped when you're being searched, but we're showing that time has been deducted. Uh, so you can continue to play the round with less time. Um, oh, yeah. oh, one thing I will mention, uh, we really wanted to show you guys the live data that was being collected as people were playing, um, but we weren't able to show it since uh, the, this projector only mirrors one computer. So if you do want to come down and see us, um, on the uh, the fifth floor, we will have the game with the server running and everything. If you guys want to take a look at the server and the live data that's being collected and whatnot, um, otherwise, I'll take this chance uh, to take any questions if anybody has any. Yes. Since it's a research research focus, what sorts of questions were you hoping to answer? Um, so, it, in that sense, it's still kind of open ended. At this point, we're kind of um, collecting as much data as possible. And at that point, they'll kind of sift through the data to see what they really want to look for, because they were also unsure exactly what they wanted to pinpoint. So we're kind of collecting just as much data as we can, uh, uh, how many items were, were collected in total, what items were stolen, whether or not they were caught, how much time um, they were penalized for, um, so stuff like that. Yes, in the back. You're saying study on criminal uh, criminal tendencies, but if they know it's a game, how can you be sure that's an accurate assessment? I, I guess that's uh, one of the things that they're going to have to take into account when uh, observing the data. Uh, Economists use uh, experiments in laboratory settings uh, because it's unethical to go out and ask people to commit these kinds of crimes. So the idea is to create an environment that people will move around and and simulate uh, uh, such behavior. And that was one and of there the... is an economic incentive to, to, to do this, but there's also punishments in place. Thank you very much, George. That was one of the research professors that we were working with uh, on our game. I, I think uh, Are you guys ready yet? One chance, one more, one more question. One more question. Yes. Uh, I feel like if I was playing the game, I wouldn't have any remorse over stealing because it's just a game. What if you added more players and you could steal from their house? So I would go to their house. Definitely, you, we would love to add more um, more NPCs and more characters. We initial uh, we initially really wanted to make this a multiplayer game, so the actual experimenters might be able to play with each other. Uh, but that was a little bit more than we uh, than we could take on for this project, unfortunately. But we would definitely like to expand upon the world. Okay, thank you. We're gonna stop. Thank you, Team K. So, hello everyone. My name is Will, and we are Team Sheeple. So, uh, basically, our project is twofold. We are making a tile editor to draw the levels for our game, and we are also making a game to test the functionality of the tile editor. So, um, before showing you guys that, I'm just going to introduce the team. I'm Will, I'm designer and producer. This is Gwyn, our programmer and web designer, Travis, programmer, Miles, designer. Josh, who will be helping me man the computer, is our sound designer and level designer. Melody and Alan did art, and Angela was another programmer. So uh, let's just jump right in. Josh, you want to open up the editor? So as you can see, uh, we have some pre-built settings in the editor right now. Uh, and basically, the point of the editor is to be game agnostic. Uh, <coughs> actually, it's, it's called GATE, which stands for Game Agnostic Tile Editor. So um, the point of that is you can basically create any game you want with this tile editor. As uh, Josh will show you, we have a top-down 2D puzzle game here. Uh, Angela also programmed a platformer game which uses this editor. So Josh, will you please make a new level for us? <laughs> Uh, the first thing he's going to want to do is to replace some tiles. So this, these are just um, 
it's just like painting basically. There's no um, there's no game logic that goes into the editor. It's just all drawing. Uh, when he's done drawing the level, he can output it as a file, and the programmer of the game reads in the file and does with it what they need to do to make the game work. Uh, so he's just painting that right now, and then uh, there's also objects. So um, if if you're experienced with game making at all, um, there's other tile editors out there. Like if you've ever heard of Tile, that's a really popular one. But one thing that we think makes our tile editor really unique from Tile is the ability to create objects in the game. Objects can have <coughs> properties. So for example, if you want to create a treasure chest and put stuff inside of the treasure chest, you can do that. Uh, and Josh, if you could just show them how that works. So he created a fan, and he can specify how far the fan will go. Um, that doesn't have any meaning to the program. It's just um, information that's saved out to the file that the program will read in later. <coughs> Uh, so now I want to get on to the second part of our presentation, which is actually showing you guys the game that we made using this tile editor. Uh, oh, oh, I forgot. <laughs> um, this is our website. Um, we are actually planning on publishing Gate, so you can download it from GitHub. Uh, it's free, it's open source, and you can check it out and give us feedback on it. We really appreciate it. Uh, so while we're getting this loaded up, Hocus Pocus is our main game that we're making to demo the project. It's a 2D tile-based puzzle game, kind of like uh, old puzzle games like Chips Challenge. Ah, that was our team logo. <laughs> our green sheeple. <laughs> so as I said, it's a 2D puzzle game, similar to old games like Chips Challenge, but our game has an added twist in it. <laughs> Uh, you can rotate the level, and that basically opens up new paths. Uh, you collect the key and get to the exit. And as you'll see, the levels get more difficult. Um, we had new mechanics like goo, which you slide on, and boxes, and that sort of thing. So after our presentation, if you want to come by and play our game, play the game that Angela made, or just test out our editor, then you can do that. So um, I'd also like to thank our mentors for helping us out. Uh, Ryan Creasy, Aaron Cato, and Daryl Despy and Kevin Calderon. Uh, they gave us a lot of good feedback on our project. And I'd also like to thank Paul Foster and Dan Frost for setting up this program. So uh, yeah, if you guys have any questions, please, I'm open to them. <laughs> yeah. So is there like some specific file format that outputs levels as or something? So the question was, what file format do we use to output levels? And uh, that's a good question, actually. We use uh, JSON. So if you're familiar with programming, JSON files are pretty easy for the regular person to read. Uh, and we, uh, we're talking about using XML or other file types, but I think we decided JSON would be the easiest. Any other questions? Yeah, in the back. For your tile placement, were you doing it by the item configuration setting, or were you doing it by order of placement to determine the layer priority? Right now, the layer priority is based on the order that you place them. We are actually adding, uh, planning on adding a feature where you can have layers, which is uh, a feature that Tiled has, which we do not yet have, but will have soon. <laughs> uh, yeah. Can you rotate during construction? Uh, you cannot do that because, as I said, it's a game agnostic tile editor, so it doesn't give you the functionality to rotate while editing. Uh, what the designers and I usually do is we draw out the levels first, we draw out every format, that, every rotation that you can put them in, and then we just paint it in the editor and it takes about a minute per level. Also, um, I just wanted to plug really quick that this game is going to be published in June, hopefully. So if you guys are interested in playing it on your Android device, you can download it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And now Team N. Okay, uh, we're Team N, and our game is uh, One Last Dungeon. I'm George, I'm project director. 
This is Shane, our lead designer, Thomas, programmer, and John, the producer. So our game is a standard like hack and slash moving kind of Diablo-ish uh, game, but it's actually just a card game. So it's a single player. You play cards, you defeat the monsters, and you get loot. This cycle repeats until you either die or you get to the end, and you can start again. So uh, one of our things that I really like about our game is that we have randomly generated loot. So we have giant loot lists. Uh, they have different rarities, different power levels. So the player will be able to pick and choose which cards go into his deck. So he could go for maybe a really healing kind of deck so that he can always live. He could go for lots of DPS. He could go for like a uh, mage, rogue, and warrior. Let's see how you play the dog. So John has picked a rogue. So they're pretty good at DPS, and they're kind of like a hybrid between Warriors and Rage. And so now he gets to pick uh, a card from one of these three. So he's picking all the cards that have like three numbers on them. That's because his class gets a bonus for using those cards. And um, it helps also players that don't really know the strategy or like what type of effects like lead or heal are good for them. Uh, usually just picking the, the cards that have three numbers on them is perfect. Uh, after the initial draft phase, which where he has to pick his first uh, starting deck of 10 cards, he'll go into a dungeon where he explores the world of our game and fights monsters and slowly gets a bigger deck, usually getting more powerful cards along the way. <coughs> so all the dungeon notes have different monsters in them. So the green ones tend to be uh, resistant to physical damage. So if you're a warrior, you might not want to go to those. And the blue ones can be resistant to water. So if you happen to be like a watery mage or something, you should probably avoid those. And uh, all our monsters are actually randomly generated. Uh, they're, they spawn depending on what type of dungeon it is. So we won't have any fire monsters spawning in or dungeon or anything. So he has mana in the bottom left, and usually you have to have enough mana to play a card. If you don't have enough mana and you have your hand to hold a card, you, there's a recycler right there, so it will get back to mana that way. And at the end of your turn, you always recycle back to black cards. So it's usually worth it to just do as much as possible, and then end your turn. Um, one other thing is that he actually throws a monster, so some of the cards have special abilities like Freeze, Bleed, uh, Warm Mana, and those those abilities like, do various stuff. So Freeze in this case would skip a monster's turn for any amount, usually just one. And um, once you defeat all the monsters, you go into the winning phase where you begin to loot all the monsters for better items, better weapons. Uh, one of the things I was really proud of in our game is that all the art uh, is taken from basically DeviantArt and other free websites. We asked the artist, hey, could we use these uh, buttons to make for our game? And uh, he said yes, and we went ahead and put them in the game. It looks really awesome. Um, and uh, so he's going to continue leading, and he's going to choose another map or node to explore, and it just keeps repeating. And uh, this is special thanks to our QA, who really tested our game a lot. They played for like seven plus hours, and like they found all sorts of problems and provided lots of powerful feedback. Uh, I'll be handing this off to Shane to talk about our design decisions. Um, yeah, so we kind of wanted to incorporate the uh, simplicity of Hearthstone. Um, all of us play Hearthstone um, as a team, so we like the game. Um, so we wanted to keep it simple so that someone can, you know, pick it up and play it. Um, but we also wanted to have like the complexity of an RPG where your decisions matter. So the class that you pick, the cards that you pick, actually have a very serious impact on 
how the game plays out. So if you like pick a mage and you end up picking like a bunch of warrior weapons, you're gonna lose pretty fast. And you'll end up killing yourself because mages, you know, have really low health. Um, so that that was something that we really worked on balancing around. Um, another thing that was important to us was uh, the dungeon diversity. So there's like George said, there's very different types of dungeons. Um, so if you are playing um, a warrior and you go into an arc dungeon, you're probably going to die, like, uh, especially in the early game. Um, it's really, really easy to die, but it's very rewarding when you kind of figure out the strategy that works for you. And that's, that's pretty much our game, so. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Questions? Yes. I noticed you do have sort of an exploration map. Is that going to, is that key to some sort of progression or is it just something <coughs> for you to choose? <coughs> Sorry, can you repeat it? I can really hear you. Is your map key to any type of progression? Um not necessarily. I mean there's an end goal of getting to the last dungeon um and getting the final boss. But uh there's no Real like storyline, I guess. Anyone else? Okay. Let's have another applause for all nine teams. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, it doesn't matter. Okay, it's gone. It's it's actually just. To make people new to the room feel silly. There's no way of knowing. Okay, so those presentations were great, and thank you for enjoying them. I hope you enjoyed them. Thank you for being here. So we, for the next two hours, we have two wonderful things to do. One is to eat, and one is to play games. So the game, the eating is out here, and the games are on the fifth and fourth floors, right below this room. There's an elevator that you can take up and down, and there's steps over there that you can take up and down. Maybe wait five minutes before, five or ten minutes before the, the doors are locked. I have to go down and unlock them. The, the people, uh, people who made the games have to get down there. So let them get a sandwich and get down there. So it'll take a minute or two. And it probably will take a few minutes before everyone gets to eat. So feel free to walk out on our wonderful patio and observe the beautiful evening if you want. Thank you all for being here at game day. And uh, have a lot of fun for the next two hours. I know, right?